don't know who said you should never meet your idols, but they got it wrong this time. My guest today is drinks podcasting royalty. And from the first moment I contacted this king of the airwaves, he was raring to join the Lush Life family. I'm Susan Schwartz, your drinking companion, and this is Lush Life Podcast. Every week, we're inspired to live life one cocktail at a time by everyone in this industry. As the fates would have it, Mark Gillespie, the host and executive producer of Whiskey Cast, the podcast that wrote the book on how to do a successful drinks podcast, from interviews to news to tastings to events, lives only minutes away from my family's home in Philadelphia. But those fickle gods kept us apart until last week when Lush Life went online. Usually he's the one doing the interviewing. Today is one of the rare occasions when he was interviewed. So pour yourself a dram and sit back and enjoy hearing how and why Mark became the man behind Whiskey Cast. Also, stick around to find out what we're drinking. Before you start, you can find links on how to donate to some of your favorite bars during this rough time on the homepage of my website, alushlifemanual.com. Now, let's begin. It's lovely to have you here. Thank you for joining me. Um, I kind of always start the same way. So I'd love to hear about uh, where you grew up, your family, and your first contact with whiskey, I guess. Okay, I grew up in central Indiana, in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, My family was not a heavily drinking family. We always had booze around the house, mostly for friends, but my dad drank mostly beer. Uh, He was a single father for most of our uh, teenage years, my kid sister and myself. And my earliest experiences with whiskey were making seven and sevens for his friends when they would come over. Uh, Seagram's Seven Crown American Whiskey and Seven Up. A little bit of ice, and I was Wait, sort he, of the in-house bartender. Yeah, you just played bartender? He said, make these for me? Yeah, basically. <laughs> that was back in the days of the human remote control when child labor was not only acceptable, but expected. You obviously made them pretty well because he kept asking you to make them again. Well, because once you learn it, after you get some feedback saying, what the heck did you do to this thing? You learned how to do it right. Now, did you ever try it? Did you sample it? I sniffed it and didn't really like the smell. I really didn't get into beer until I was in college and not into whiskey until much later in life. Mm-hmm. But uh, essentially, I sort of was always destined for this point, I think, just because uh My father always said I would make a living with my mouth, and broadcasting and media was the one way I could do it legally. And did you you like doing it? Was that what you wanted to do when you grew up, say? Yeah, I got my first radio job the day I got out of high school in 1980 at a little small radio station in Columbus, Indiana, about uh, half an hour, about eh, 20 minutes from the house, and was uh, having having fun. Pardon? What were you reporting on there? Uh, back then, I was just a DJ and reading right. a little bit of local news off the wire at the top of the hour, the rip and read, the wire copy, uh, the latest statewide news after the national news at the top of the hour. And I'd read a couple of minutes of local news and uh, do the weather and uh, get back to the music. And so college, you were tele- telecommunications, right, all the way? Telecommunications major at Indiana University, which had at the time and still does one of the best media schools in the country. And I had the chance to work with some really sharp people. I wound up getting moving over to a radio station in Bloomington near the campus for the last couple of years of college as a, a weekend DJ, believe it or not, for a pop radio station. There are songs that when they come on the radio today, I cringe because I used to play those in heavy rotation over and over again as a imagine. DJ in the early 80s. And I'm going, I not know this song by heart again, because, right? pardon? <laughs> Not Devo again. Yeah, stuff <laughs> like that. Um, that was back in the days when John Mellencamp was uh, having hits, and he lived in Bloomington, so he would you would see him occasionally at the grocery store and things like that, and would have to resist telling Mellencamp jokes on the air, things like that, just because we were afraid he was going to come over to the station one night and not be a happy camper. No, exactly. <laughs> but uh, after that, Worked my way around uh, radio and TV stations in uh, everywhere from uh, 
deep southern Illinois and coal country to uh, Detroit, then Houston, then Anchorage, Alaska for seven years as a reporter and anchor for the NBC station there, KTUU. And it was the best job I ever had. They let me cover anything I wanted to practically. Uh, I was the chief political reporter. I also did a, a business segment every Monday night. And in 1995, they actually let me create a technology segment when we had tech stories to report. I remember doing a piece on the launch of Windows 95 back Crazy. then. And I was one of the first reporters to actually put an email address out on the air for people to email me. And it was an AOL email address that is no uh, longer valid. You know, I remember someone giving me their email address in 1995 and me saying, what am I going to do with that? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> well, I remember my first email address was a CompuServe address. Oh, and boy. It was 73353,256 at CompuServe.com. And people would look at that and go, what is what? that? <laughs> now, to, to the whiskey, were you still just drinking beer? Or yeah. Or had whiskey come into your life yet? Whiskey came into my life as I was getting ready to leave Alaska. In 1997, my grandmother had been living in Sarasota, Florida, and had passed away in the summer of 97. I was the oldest living relative, and I wound up having to deal with the estate and taking care of all of her things. So mm -hmm. I'm down in Sarasota. There is a uh, place down there called Michael's on East. For years, it was the home of the uh, Whiskey Obsession Festival each spring. It's now moved this year up to Tampa. But Michael's had a satellite location. It was called the Tasting Room, right near the hospital in Sarasota. Little small hole-in-the-wall um, shop that was, half of it was a wine bar with desserts and stuff like that, gourmet desserts. And the other half was a retail liquor store where you could walk through the uh, passageway in between the two. If you found something you liked in the bar, you could go across and buy it in the shop. And I was hanging out there because it was a neat little place and I could go in and get something to eat, get a drink and get a glass of wine or a, a beer and relax. And one night I walk in, they're running a special on single malt scotches, a flight of single malts, I think for like 15 bucks. Mm -hmm. And I thought at the time, you know, I hadn't really tried whiskey since college when we all used to do shots and then never swore we'd never touch whiskey again. But a few years later, you think, okay, maybe it's time to see if I can get past beer and wine and learn to try something different. So I sat down at the bar, pulled out my card and said, okay, teach me what you know. Do so, you remember? Do you remember what they were? I never found out what the four whiskeys were. He just poured uh -huh. four samples from different distilleries, different regions of Scotland. There was a, a Highland, um, an Isla. I believe there was a Speyside, and I think there might have been a Lowland. But he poured four of them, and I immediately picked up on the differences between them, sipping them, and liked it. And I realized, hello, this could be... At the time, I didn't think, no, this is not going to be a career change. But I'm thinking, I could learn to like this. So I finished them. Had a lot of water in between with all of them, because they were just like little tiny small sample pours. Mm -hmm. And before I left to go back up to Alaska, I went over to the liquor store side and bought a set of Balvenie miniatures, because they had the three packs of the Balvenie miniatures yeah. back then because that was all the room I had in my suitcase to go back up north and took those back to Alaska. And, and why, why do you think you picked the Belveni? Was it just the only ones they had? It was the three miniatures, and I could try three different ones, and it was cheap. All right. And I could fit them in my suitcase. I couldn't fit a full-size bottle in my bag, but I could fit the three minis. And it was, uh, it was better than just buying one or two individual minis. It was a set chance to try the differences between them. So I get back up to Alaska, and... After a couple of years, I'm down in New Jersey finally with uh, my family. My wife at the time had decided that at the time she was going to go back to graduate school at Temple in Philadelphia, so we moved down here. And I'm working for a company that produced a lot of content for CNN. And 
one of the things we did at the time was we did a radio piece for CNN Radio. Well, this was in 19 or 2005, rather. 2005, when podcasting was just sort of, people were talking about it a little bit, saying, hey, this could be something good someday. We got the idea that, uh, or I shouldn't say we, um, somebody above my pay grade got the idea that we ought to do a podcast series. That's really early. So, yeah. Yeah, so early that uh, I said, wait a second, because <laughs> I was the poor schmuck that was going to have to make this work. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know anything about it other than, okay, this is a way to do a radio show and deliver it on the internet. But I didn't know how we're going to make this thing work. So I said, let me go play for a bit. Give me some time. Let me go play with this and see what we're getting ourselves into. So that uh, if we decide after a few weeks that this is a bigger pain in the neck than we thought it was going to be and we decide to kill it, we don't risk a company brand. We don't put the company brand on the line saying, we're going to do this podcast and then we kill it after a few weeks. So I figured... I thought at the time about maybe doing something with whiskey in the podcasting space because I figured it was a chance for me to learn more about whiskey. Um, as a journalist, I, I learned by asking people questions. And I figured, okay, if I can talk to distillers and blenders and the people who make this stuff, I can learn more about this. So I said, okay, let me play with a whiskey podcast. Now, I should tell you that earlier that year, I was active on the Whiskey Magazine message boards in the old online forums that they used to have. And I had asked folks, if I produced a whiskey podcast, would you guys listen? And this was in the summer of 2005. There were 17 responses. 14 said, what's a podcast? <laughs> Two said, mm, I don't know. And one said, yes. You already have an audience, an audience of one. Yeah, we built this entire thing based on one person saying they would listen. Is essentially the way it worked. Just to back up a teeny bit. Um, oh, I have so many questions going on in my head. So first, when he said that about podcasts and you were looking into podcasts, how many were there and where did you listen to them? Did iTunes even exist then? iTunes had come out and just added support. ITunes, podcasting became big when iTunes added support for podcasts. Podcasting really started in 2003, 2004 time period when folks like Adam Curry and mm -hmm. Dave Jackson and those guys came up with the ideas for or how to adapt and make really simple syndication, RSS feeds, that you could use to get recurring content and have it check and see if there was a new show added. But there weren't many podcatchers available at the time. Only when Apple really installed the support for podcasts in iTunes in 2005, did it start to take off? When we started WhiskeyCast when, in November of 2005, there were maybe 3,000 podcasts total. That now many, there's more than... many. Yeah, there, now there are hundreds of thousands. All right, the other thing is, so we left you with three mini bottles. Yeah. In your suitcase. You got to tell me about how you started to develop even more of a taste for it. Well, I was developing the taste, and after I'd moved back to New Jersey, I had uh, I was getting active in it. I have this nasty habit of when I find something I like or a topic or a subject matter that I like, I tend to go down the rabbit hole with it and really become interested in it to the point almost not quite obsession, but I want to learn everything I can about a subject. And I don't do that with many subjects, but the ones that I do, I tend to, I tend to learn a lot about. Uh, as a journalist, I tend to be, journalists tend to have a broad base of knowledge that's kind of shallow. You learn a lot of things, or you learn a little bit about a lot of stuff. Hmm. Because you retain it as you're covering stories and you pick up things. You get this broad variety of knowledge, but it doesn't go very deep. It gets you enough to where you have enough knowledge to get by, but not enough to be considered or to even think about being thought, thought of as an expert. And I will, still, I will tell you, I'm not there with whiskey yet. But um, 
on those rare occasions when I find something that really interests me, I go down the rabbit hole and start learning everything I can. And that's what happened with whiskey. Did you just read every book? Were you able to, you know, try everything? Were there places oh, no. in Philadelphia or where you live to uh, No, I was basically drink? just uh, getting whatever I could get my hands on in terms of the occasional mag, because back then we had uh, Malt Advocate at the time and Whiskey Magazine. And there were a few books out. That was when Michael Jackson, the author, was still with us and writing his mm -hmm. books and updating his guides. And we had a few whiskey books by folks like Ian Buxton, Charlie McLean, Jim Murray, and some of those folks. So I was getting my hands on those to try to read more. And then just basically learning everything I could and tasting whatever I could get my hands on when I could do it. Uh, didn't have a lot of money available to me, but uh, when I could, I would try stuff. Did you travel anywhere? Did no. you go to Kentucky? No. no. Scotland, no. No. Not before I started the show. In November of 2015, or 2005, rather, I went to a Malt Advocates Whiskey Fest at the Marriott Marquis in New York with the recorder of the microphone. Did some interviews with uh, folks like the late Dr. Jim Swan, the late great Parker Beam, and some other folks. And then came back and produced uh, three or four podcasts, little short ones, maybe five, ten minutes long. And at that point, after I started telling people on the boards, on the Whiskey Magazine board, about this, and said, hey, go take a listen, tell me what you think. Then they came back and said, oh, that's what you meant by a podcast. <laughs> we thought you were just going to sit in your basement and rant and rave about whiskeys for a bit, and we didn't want to listen to that. That's what I do now, but I kid. <laughs> so I went back to the Brain Trust at the office and said, yes, we can do this. Here's what it's going to take. Here's how we do it. And here's what the IT guys are going to have to do. Here's what it's going to take to make this thing work. So we start producing it. Um, six months later, they close my studio in New Jersey, stop oh. working with the TV network, lay me off, move the studio to Washington, and hire a kid for a third of my salary. Mm. It happens. That's part of media. So... I wind up at Bloomberg TV for three years in New York while I'm still producing the show in my spare time and starting to get an audience. And then we have the financial crisis in the fall of 2008 into 2009. Bloomberg has its first layoffs ever in okay. early 2009. I survived the first round. I did not survive the second in July of 2009. This is where the I becomes a we in terms of whiskey cast. And I've used that term I a lot, but it really is a we, and this is where it became important. Because over the course of the next year, while the severance pay was coming in, I had one job interview. Oh, yeah. And that was the re and during that recession, during the Great Recession of 2008-2009, the U.S. lost 100,000 media jobs. So nobody was hiring. And they weren't going to hire a middle-aged guy who was mid-level executive uh, as an editor at Bloomberg as on the assignment desk. There was no interest because they can get younger, cheaper, whatever. Mm -hmm. But we had some advertising revenue starting to come in from the show, and we had built an audience. So... Towards the end of the severance package, my business partner, Christina, and our daughters, Brianna, Arya, and Tessa, God love them all, sat me down for what I generally refer to as the come to Jesus meeting. They sat me down and said, you know, this thing is cute, but, and we think it's got some potential. You do a good job with it, and the show sounds good. But frankly, you suck at business. <laughs> Which they were right. I am not a business person. Um, I was the guy in the newsroom who would go, bat, 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 integrity alert when the sales guys would come in. Which they loved. I'm sure. Uh, you know, a lot of creatives yeah. are not so great at business. Yeah. You know, you're not alone there. But fortunately, Christina is. 
because she had been a small business consultant, marketing, PR person, and she knew this stuff inside out. I had not given it to her because I was a control freak and wanted to have control over this. This was the one thing I had that I was doing. I learned that by giving up control, things become a success. And that was the big lesson I learned from all this was once I said, that well, they told me, you can keep doing this, but you got to let mom take over the business side. I love that your daughters did that. And I said, <laughs> you know what? You're right. Let's do it. Right. And the rest is history. The rest is history. She revamped the entire marketing kit that I had was basically two pages of text, a couple of cute little graphs and one picture, turned it into a full-fledged media kit, went out and basically made it self-sustaining to the point now where it is now our full-time business between the two of us. And she runs it, and I am what is affectionately known around here as the talent. <laughs> you are the talent. Now, speaking of talent, um, from the beginning, I just would love to talk about the progression of the show. Um, because I listened to the, some of the, the, the first ones oh God. and, um, and of course a lot of the, the, um, the modern ones or the, the contemporary ones. And did you know, I know you were kind of at the beginning, you know, now you have news and tastings and chat. Did you think that's what you wanted at the beginning or did you just have a little bit of information that you're going to make it into something? Well, I knew that uh, I knew how to produce a news show. I knew how to produce a show from my years in the newsroom. And I figured we're always going to start with the news because that's the stuff that's going to change from week to week. And it's going to be the stuff, if, if, if I'm reporting the stuff that people want to hear about, or want to know what's happening, that they're curious about, then that's what's going to draw them in. And then I tried to bring it in with uh, the feature interviews, but gradually the interviews became longer. We got more news. Um, it became easier for me to do telephone interviews and do longer form interviews. And it wasn't until several years into the show that I even started doing tasting notes. Because right. I, I saw that at the beginning, you didn't, you didn't right. do them. Mm -hmm. and it, that was part of my evolution because mm -hmm. I said at first, I'm not qualified to do tasting notes. I'm not qualified to rate whiskeys. I don't know enough yet. And it finally came down to the point in late 2007, early 2008, I was asked to become a member of the Malt Maniacs, which was this exclusive group of whiskey lovers uh, focusing on single malts primarily that was with people in all over the world, with uh, like 20 mm -hmm. members all over the world. And they had invited me to join. One of the conditions was that I had to post tasting notes on their malt monitor. Uh. I had been doing them informally just for my own learning and so that I could write down, okay, this is what I'm getting from this whiskey and stuff like that. But they said, okay, if you're going to be a maniac, you got to make the notes public. And it also came down to the point where I was getting feedback from our listeners saying, you know what? We know you're getting to taste these great whiskeys. Why don't you share what your impressions with us? If you're getting to taste them, it seems like a waste of time if you're not sharing the impressions. So I started doing tasting notes. Now with those, since you brought up the fans, your fans, um, how did you see them grow from the beginning to now over such a long time? You know? Well, it's been great because we've got people who have been listening all along. And people who go back and say, I remember listening to you back when the show was six minutes long and that original intro music. And they've been with us. We've had they've, listeners have come to the house. We've actually had people that have said, because I close every show with it, comes to you from the charming yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. People will be driving by on the interstate. They'll see the Haddonfield sign and they'll go, I wonder if Mark would let us stop by to say hello. <gasps> and they'll email. And if I'm home, well, we work from home. And if I know that, uh, if I've had email exchanges with them in the past, we'll say, yeah, if we're free and the house is relatively uh, picked up and everybody's in a great mood and we can do it, come on by. Are they also like, um, and you know that art bag that you tried a few years ago, could we have a sample of that? You know what? You see all these whiskeys behind me on the wall here? I do. That's just part of the collection. 
And we have referred to it, and we continue to refer to it as a library. If somebody comes to my house, if a, if a guest comes over here, if they come to the house and they want to try something, there are maybe 10 bottles that I, won't, I don't want to open. There's one bottle I will never open. And if somebody really wants to try something, yeah, I'll pour it for them. Because let's be honest, I didn't pay for 90% of these bottles. They were sent to me as samples to taste and do tasting notes on and do reviews on. And sometimes they send small mini bottles, but some, a lot of times they send full-size bottles. And that's great. Uh, because what I do is I keep it here as a library and we can go back and taste them and I pour them for company and we'll do every, once in a while, uh, every so often I'll donate a tasting to a charity auction where I'll go to some, I'll let them auction off a tasting where I go to somebody's house, bring six bottles and a bunch of glasses and lead a tutored tasting for the winning bidder and several of their friends. Oh my, so much fun. And we've raised some several thousand dollars for charities that way, but we treat it as we're the caretakers of this whiskey because frankly, there's more here than I will ever be able to drink in my entire life, me and my entire family. And I've told everybody that when I die, it's either you guys have to have one hell of a party or I get a Viking funeral. Now we're not talking about dying right now. I know. I know. You but said that you, um, had, you hadn't traveled. What was the first, um, travel to drink excursion first one well the first two were actually courtesy of maker's mark uh first one was i think in maybe 2008 or so 2007 2008 they invited me out to visit the distillery was that the first time you'd been to kentucky for a distillery visit yes uh. and so i went out to maker's mark and Actually, no, wait a second. I'm sorry about that. No, it was the first one was actually, that was in the spring of 2008. That was after they had invited me out to Vegas for their what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas party that they had for their ambassadors at Caesar's Palace um, in late 2007. And that was... Uh, an interesting experience. There are some pictures floating around, but part of the evening involved a toga party. It also involved Bill Samuels Jr. dressing up like a Roman cardinal, complete with the uh, pointy hat and everything. So I assume it was at Caesar's Palace. It was. It was at Caesar's, and it was a. It was a good weekend. But uh, those were the first two distillery trips, and then later in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, I got to go to Scotland for the first time. And ever since then, it's been a, a lot of travel over the years. I've had the chance to do things I would never have dreamed of doing. And I love the fact that uh, people think enough of me to invite me to come visit their distillery. I think it's, it's flattering. It's, uh, it's humbling because uh, I still have so much to learn about all this. I, I'm, I learn things every time I talk to a distiller or a blender. I, I'm still learning about, all, about whiskeys. And I don't think I'll ever learn, I know I'll never learn everything there is to know. Um, and I, I really have to give the credit to my family because uh, were it not for them sitting me down for that uh, Come to Jesus meeting back in uh, 2010, I don't know what we'd be doing right now or what I'd be doing right now because uh, I probably would have been stubborn enough to insist on continuing what I was doing and they would have said, yeah, that doesn't work for us. And, and you wouldn't be here talking to me. I wouldn't be here talking to you right now. Which would be very sad. And sharing a dram. Yes, sharing a dram. But it has been it has been an absolute hoot all along the way. Because uh, when you get to talk to folks like the great Jimmy Russell of Wild Turkey, um, when you get to talk to Dennis Malcolm at Glen Grant Distillery, in Scotland, or John Campbell of Lafroig, or Mickey Heads at Ardbeg, who's going to be retiring this fall as the distillery manager there. When you get to talk to guys like Barry Crockett, who was the uh, second generation master distiller at Middleton, who followed his father, and, he, and Barry grew up at the old Middleton distillery in the distiller's cottage. When you get to talk to these guys and share, because, and 
let, and they share their stories with me so that I can share them with the audience. That's the key. That's why this is not about me. It's about the stories. It's about preserving the legacy of whiskey for the next generation. One of my big regrets was that I never got to interview Booker No from Jim Beam. Booker passed in 2004, a year before I started doing the show. And I never got to interview him, but I would, loved, I would have loved to go back and talk to him. Of all the spirits out there, really the romance of, of whiskey, especially Scottish whiskey, uh, I mean, there's nothing like it. And so, you know, hearing the stories being told over and over again, it never gets boring. And there's always something new to learn. And it's, it's wonderful to have the storytellers, you know, continue. That's just it. I mean, whiskey has far more romance and storytelling to it than any other spirit, I think, because of the fact that you have to age it. Because it goes back four to 500 years, you have all these great stories. The fact that uh, it's pretty much the only consumer product that you produce it, and then you let it sit for 10 years or more before you actually put it in a bottle and sell it. You wouldn't do that with a car. You don't see uh, General Motors sitting cars down in the parking lot and then selling them six years later as a six-year-old car. Uh, six-year-old cars are pretty well shot, but a six-year-old whiskey is just starting to get good. Right. You have to have patience. You have to be calm. You mm -hmm. have to be somewhere beautiful. I mean, there's it's romance, really. There is a story that I tell occasionally, um, or at least a comparison I make. Um, a lot of folks use or have a specific brand of laundry detergent that they use. Um, but when was the last time you ever saw somebody line up for a tour of the laundry detergent plant, <laughs> let alone get the plant manager to sign a bottle of it? I love that. That happens with whiskeys all the time. Oh, <laughs> I love that. Well, let's toast to yes. all those stories in the past. So what do you, what do you have in your glass? Tell me what you have. Well, I have a private label. Let me get the bottle. Okay. Um, I was. This is the know, interviewer and me taking over for a brief second here. Uh, I um, was lucky enough to go to Maker's Mark, and that was—I can't say that was my—that was my first Kentucky um, distillery visit as well. Um, I have been to Ireland and been to the ones in Ireland and some in Scotland, and they had there a private select. Mm -hmm. And it is 109.9 .9 proof, and it is the Oak Stave Selection by Maker's Mark Distillery, Fall 2018. And you could only get it there. So it's a very special one. I saved it to drink it with you. I appreciate that. What I have in my glass is a very unique Canadian whiskey from Shelter Point Distillery in uh, British Columbia on Vancouver Island. It's their Smoke Point whiskey that won... Uh, uh, I, I believe it won a gold medal and a couple of other awards at the recent Canadian Whiskey Awards that I was privileged to be a judge in. And I bought a bottle of it to bring home because I found one of the last two bottles that were available at the Strath in Victoria for sale. But it's mature. It's a single malt that's matured in ex Isla whiskey casks. Ooh. So it's not peated barley, but it's a peated cask. So it has that peaty influence without being overpowering. So we have that. So I have that one to drink. Well, I'll look for that. You won't find it in. You won't find it anywhere because it's sold out now. But uh, maybe, maybe I'll bring a sample when I come over to London next. I would love that. So cheers. Cheers. And to London, to you, and thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much to Mark for his support and also for all his patience dealing with internet issues. Now Mark is a dram man, as most whiskey drinkers are. But when pressed to give me a cocktail he loved, he revealed a penchant for the simple Irish whiskey and ginger ale. Also, since he mentioned another easy-to-make cocktail in our chat, I've included both as our Cocktails of the Week. The first cocktail of the week is his Irish whiskey and ginger ale. Mark suggests adding 1.5 ounces of whiskey to a highball glass, followed by a couple of ice cubes, 
and then topped with ginger ale. The second cocktail of the week is the perennial favorite, the Seagram 7 and 7. The drink that Diageo called the quintessential dive bar drink. How many of us can't wait to go back to our local bar, dive or fancy? You only need two ingredients and a garnish. Seagram 7 Crown Whiskey and 7-Up Soda, or if you're in the UK, lemonade. Plus a lemon wheel if you have it. Add two ounces of Seagram 7 into a highball glass loaded with ice. Top that with six ounces of 7-Up and then stir. You can drink it right away or you can make it pretty by sliding the lemon wheel to the glass edge. You can find this recipe, more easy recipes, and all the cocktails of the week at alushlifemanual.com, where you'll also find all the ingredients in our shop. Most of you don't know that my partner is a Cypriot. While we've been stuck inside, we've been trying our hand at making some Cypriot cuisine. Number one, black-eyed peas, carrots, and potatoes topped with loads of olive oil, salt, and lemon juice, and olive oil packed tuna. As good as it is, it tastes that little bit better in Cyprus, accompanied by a glass of local white wine and the sun on our faces. If you live for Lush Life, would you consider supporting us by buying us a coffee? Just go to buymeacoffee.com slash Lush Life, and you can donate once or monthly to make sure we're still here every Tuesday. Theme music for Lush Life is by Stephen Shapiro and used with permission. And Lush Life is always and will be forever produced by Evo Terra and Simpler Media Productions. Which leads me to say the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation, and always, always drink responsibly. Yes, I said it again. And wash your hands and stay safe. Next week, we are heading to Australia virtually, that is, to enjoy a coffee with the global brand ambassador of Mr. Black and the owner of Maybe Sammy, the Australian Wunderbar. Until that time, bottoms up.